Good afternoon, and welcome to this episode of the Mashrek Sustainability Dialogues, a Mashrek podcast series that facilitates knowledge exchange with critical voices tasked with leading the region's drive toward net zero. Today, we're looking at how economies in the region can leverage windfalls to make their models more sustainable and more diversified. With various opportunities at the disposal of regional players, we'll explore how stakeholders can keep up with the momentum towards the dual priorities of economic diversification alongside sustainable development. I'm happy to welcome today's guests and hear their insights and perspectives. We have with us today Vijay Valecha, Chief Investment Officer at Century Financial, Florian Mertz, Director of UAE Industries at Mubadala, Mohamed Teleb, Global Director of Commercial Operations at Celeros Flow Technology, and of course, our Mashrek host, Thomas Jacob, Senior Vice President and Head of Strategy at Mashrek. I'd like to start off by inviting our guests to make some opening statements on this question, and Thomas, we'll kick it off with you. I welcome your opening thoughts on today's topic. Great. Uh, th thank you, Thomas. Uh, first of all, uh, let me kind of say good evening to Vijay, Florian, Mohammed, and you too, Thomas, and thank you all for making the time. So I think on behalf of Mashrik, it is my great pleasure and privilege to invite you all to this session as part of the Mashrik Sustainability Dialogues. Now, I think this is a very timely discussion with the region showing one of the highest GDP growth rates in the world on the back of the good old high oil prices. But on the flip side, I think the MENA region is also at serious risk from the effects of the climate change. Right? It's warming at almost twice the global average. I think that is worth keeping in mind. And closer home, the UAE has also witnessed good economic growth. And more importantly, the president of UAE, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, has announced that 2023 will be the year of sustainability. And this has particular significance as the UAE is preparing to host the 28th United Nations Climate Change Summit, or COP28, later this year, as you're all aware. So, you know, to use an old adage, strike when the iron is hot. And I believe this discussion will help guide on what areas are the best to strike at. With that, I hand it back to Tomas. Thank you, Thomas, for those opening thoughts. And on that theme of striking while the iron is hot, Florian, we'll go to you next. We welcome your opening thoughts. And uh, if you could describe for us the current landscape as you see it for sustainable economic diversification in the region, what's been achieved so far and what's next on the agenda? Uh, w uh, welcome and good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here as one of the uh, panelists and uh, to outline the position which uh, we as Mobadala and also our subsidiaries and investees companies have. And the point of, uh, as mentioned, sustainability uh, has not been a topic which has just come up as we have, as you alerted uh, through to windfall profits from the oil industry. No, energy transition has been a very cornerstone element of the UAE uh, energy transition history. And this is noticed by five waves which we have seen. The first one already started 45 years ago with the UAE commencing LNG uh, exports as first country here in the region. In the beginning of the uh, millennium, we, we saw the first cross-border pi gas pipeline uh, with a dolphin coming up and providing low carbon uh, power to the UAE. Uh, the third wave was uh, in about 16 years ago, the creation of MASTAR, our renewable energy ent uh, entity, uh, also the first one in the region. Followed closely after that was the nuclear energy uh, generation uh, of the Baraka pa power plants. And now it's time for clean hydrogen uh, coming up. And we are proud to say that Mubadala's leadership has been closely involved and instrumental to the last four of these waves. So it's in our hearts already, and we are going to expand it going forward. Great, thank you. And Mohammed, I, I welcome your thoughts as well. The region, not just the UAE, but the region generally has a favorable and positive economic outlook for the year, in part thanks to the achievements from last year and the windfalls from last year in various sectors um, that are now providing opportunities for, for the region. 
What do you think are some opportunities that we're seeing now in 2023 to build off of the success of last year and advance the goals of sustainable uh, and economic diversification? I don't think that Florian left much for me to speak about because it's basically those sectors. Energy, energy transition um, is a function of a very important aspect, which is energy mix. And you cannot focus on, on one aspect and leave the other. I will, um, attending ADIPIC, which is um, one of the largest petroleum and oil and gas conferences in the world, this year, the discussion mainly was how would oil and gas based companies and countries can contribute to sustainable development. It's not only out of um, a surplus and in income because of uh, of the prices of the oil, but also out of moral and um, environmental responsibility towards that. And we're, we're lucky enough because one and a half months later, we have the Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week, which is uh, sponsored under Masdar, and it, it had exactly the same uh, the same theme, which is energy transition. Uh, there were plenty of MOUs and um, initial studies done by several governments. We've seen many of those signed within the UAE, Saudi Arabia, with NEOM. In Egypt, we have also about five MOUs regarding the hydrogen and green hydrogen production, which which is it's it comes to the cornerstone of, of the energy mix. But also we are seeing investments in carbon removal. So oil and gas is uh, no doubt one of the major polluters um, of our planet. But can we actually stop using it now? In 2022, we've seen shortage of uh, of oil and gas and refined products, so gasoline in your car, right? So now we've, we've seen Adnoc, for example, invest in a carbon removal startup, which is very, very strange for an oil and gas company to do. Um, that is using Hajar Mountains between Oman and UAE in order to uh, capture um, carbon and remove it from the atmosphere using an accelerated method. So I think that these are are, are going forward. I, I, I see some of the sovereign funds are focused on sustainability, and this, is, this also would give it um, momentum to satisfy the ESG targets for countries and governments. Absolutely. Thank you. And Vijay, we'll go to you next. Uh, building off of Mohammed's comments, it sounds like a multifaceted, collaborative, all hands on deck approach. And Gulf countries have these ambitions to become global centers of finance, but also global centers of sustainability. Combining sustainability with finance, you get climate finance. And to that end, as an example, Saudi Arabia's public investment fund raised uh, billions of dollars in their inaugural green bonds uh, late last year. The UAE is another example will host COP28 at the end of this year. With all of this momentum, what do you see are the opportunities for using funds and financial resources uh, to help advance climate finance? Well, that's a very interesting comment, uh, Thomas. Uh, very well spoken by Mr. Mohammed and Ms. Florian and Mr. Thomas. Uh, majorly to add to that, I think the major difference that we are seeing now is sustainability is not just on the agenda, it is a part of the major part of the agenda. It is what I think all companies and all countries are talking about, all governments, especially in the Gulf region, because as Thomas said, we are actually growing uh, the heat wave twice as much as the rest of the world, and it really impacts this, this part of the world more than others. This has been a major problem, but not just uh, that UAE and the GCC countries are helping out their own countries, the major initiative is also coming, like you said, the green bonds. They're not just being issued for Saudi Arabia or for the UAE. They're actually being issued for the developing nations. The developed nations already have programs running. The developing nations don't really have programs running. And the developing nations is where most of the carbon footprint is right now lying towards. That is a major process which we have to tackle. And that, I think, is what the GCC countries are trying to do. It's an excellent initiative for sure. It is still, I think, a little still underlooked. It should be more higher on the cards because it's just not a moral uh, ground. It's actually existential ground. If the temperatures do rise and we are seeing erratic temperatures coming in. I mean, it was, I think, the year 1994 and we had heard of global warming and we all thought it's a joke, but we realize now 30 years later that uh, global warming is not just real, it's actually affecting all of our lives. So it's an existential problem which actually should be tackled at a more higher level. So yes, these initiatives are great. They need to be scaled up much more faster. And that's what is the most important thing that's going to happen this year. 
And to take those comments a little bit further with this high level approach that really sustainability has has entered the core of any strategy in the region. We're seeing uh, an evolution of different approaches where, for example, some organizations uh, offer products and services related to green finance that are basically compose the entire suite of products and services that they offer, whereas other entities are incorporating those same services uh, geared towards climate finance within a much broader range of services that are offered within a product suite. Do you think that there are any pros or cons to having uh, any one of those two approaches? Well, there are no pros and cons as of today because as of today, we don't really have the answers for all the all the questions. Uh, while we are right now pushing for clean hydrogen, is hydrogen the right solution is also quite unknown. Uh, there are a lot of research going on. There's a lot of money being spent on R&D on actually trying to get renewable energy better and better. I mean, we all have seen what a massive hit Tesla was, and that was majorly because it was an EV vehicle. Uh, is that the way forward? Is, is solar energy the only form of energy that we can be looking at? The major idea is more research and more development, not just on the public front, but also the private companies coming in uh, will definitely be boosting up. All that is required is that, you know, there should be funding, there should be enough uh, people actually backing these systems. And that is what uh, it needs to be collective effort more than, you know, just one one company or one country just doing it. I may just, just add to what which you were saying. I'll also kind of give a banking uh, view to that because the parallel I will draw is kind of to the Islamic finance space, right? And I think we've seen uh, a case of where both models exist. When I say both models, there are the kind of standalone Islamic banks as well as even conventional banks doing what are called Islamic windows. So, you know, to kind of go back to your initial question, I think sustainability also can probably follow a similar approach, you know, it, that both can work. I don't think it needs to be a, a either or kind of a situation, you know, just to add to what Vijay was saying. Yes, absolutely. And and to that point, and to Florian's, uh, to Vijay's point rather, Florian, we'll go to you next. Uh, different stakeholders have been mentioned, the government, uh, NGOs, uh, private enterprises, and really, as is the case with any grand national strategy, uh, a strategic approach that's often taken is to involve cross-sectoral partnerships, um, including the public sector, private enterprises, NGOs, uh, international collaboration. What do you see as the role of partnerships and these different kinds of cross-sectoral stakeholder engagements uh, for driving diversification? So, so from, from our side, partnerships, and we call them win-win partnerships are a a one of the four uh, bit, um, core values of Mobadala, which since our inception over 20 years ago has always played a very high role. Uh, so we, not, we don't uh, undertake activities on our own. We do them to, uh, together with our partners to make them happen and to make them more impactful. And uh, when we uh, look at our current investment portfolio. Let me outline how we do this uh, uh, together and how they impact uh, then uh, our targets. The first one and uh, driving also, let's say, sustainability is the power generation and the power uh, a transfer or energy transfer, which we do by uh, by Mazdar, which I mentioned before, where we uh, where we welcomed Adnok and Taka, both Abu Dhabi heavyweights, in the end of last year to become shareholders in Mazdar, in both businesses, in the renewable business as well as in the green hydrogen business. Together, we are uh, establishing this as a national champion with a worldwide uh, investment scope to drive energy transition. The second one is an uh, important component is decarbonization. And here, uh, Mobadala together with Dubai Holding uh, and its investee company EGA drive decarbonization. Uh, as you are aware, Aluminium takes a lot of energy. About 60% of the of the emissions comes from the electricity generation. And here, Emirates Global Aluminium is the first company in the world which produces uh, aluminium with the power of the sun and markets this as a solar aluminium. The third one is where we all have to look at is the uh, energy efficiency, and also here. 
we are working together with our partners, Abu Dhabi ones and international ones, for example, in the area of desalination. So we are invested in two desalination facilities, one of which is really the biggest one in the world. And they use this extremely efficient reverse osmosis technology uh, that, that allows us to be extremely efficiency, uh, efficient on the desalination of water. Showing together we can reach uh, a better footprint going forward in partnership with other partners on the technology side as well as on the finance side. Great. And it, um, Mohammed, we'll go to you next uh, to build off of Florian's comments. Uh, decarbonization, desalination, multiple initiatives happening simultaneously, and the ecosystem is also multifaceted. You have government, you have institutional investors, you have industry players, and also you have startups and venture capital that look to solve these kinds of problems from an innovative point of view. Um, with your background working with a lot of startups and advising startups, can you tell us a little bit about your experience working at this intersection between entrepreneurship, innovation, and sustainability? Um, I'll start with sustainability and environmental impact is a is a multi-tiered problem that requires a multi-tiered solution. Um, so as an example, what Florian said on, on the government side, looking at the big um, carbon dioxide producers like EGA or any other industry for that matter, or looking at more efficient desalinization or looking at uh, renewable energy investments, whether in solar or in nuclear, in order to provide power, uh, clean power to the people. Now, the, the, the population have to use this in, a, in an efficient manner in order to reduce the emissions, right? And this is where um, startups have a, a very big role um, because startups can come up with those micro solutions that are consumer based, as an example, um, finding more um, effective ways to clean our air conditioning. 80% of the energy used in the UAE and the Gulf, for that matter, household, is from air conditioning. There is a chance that we reduce um, or increase the efficiency by 70%. It means we reduce the, the, the energy consumed by 70%. And that happens at a consumer level. And for the government or, or for large corporations to speak to the consumer in this case will be very difficult. So you need to support a startup that will enable the consumer to use technology that is affordable to have more efficient systems in their homes, smart homes, inverter-based air conditioning, and things of that sort. So this is one aspect of that. The other is, um, especially on the decarbonization um. Um, there is a there is a, a fund, there's a VC that is called Frontier Climate. And what they did is they, they've um, opened a fund for worth about $900 million. And they're one of the, the ones that are investing in um, 44.01, which is the carbon removal company I mentioned at the beginning. I'm just taking them as an example. And they know that the investment in this field is a, is a very long-term investment. You cannot assess the growth of the startup based on the basic um, financial statement rules or success or multiple of revenues or any of, of the known business success um, the criteria, right? And um, I think that this is where this is the gap that we miss here. The PIF or Mubadala or ABQ are very good at funding, and this is what they should be doing. They're very good at funding the government owned projects or PPP projects, private uh, um, public uh, partnership projects that are huge and that will have an impact on the economy and, 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 and a diversification of, of, of the income. But then we will really lack um, funds in between this and micro funds that would actually be more patient in the return on their investment in startups that are working in the sustainability business. We have great examples. Uh, I think Mazdar has a, a small arm that is doing this. DIFC, I think, is also incubating a couple of those as well. Um, I think in five as well, but it's not uh, at the rate that would allow us to do that transformation simultaneously. The tier that has to do with the consumers and the tier that has to do with uh, the, the the public or the country-based projects. 
understood and absolutely entrepreneurship and innovation are indicators of economic vitality. And VJ, in addition to entrepreneurship, the depth of capital markets is also an indicator for, for the maturity of, of an economic system. And to give an example, Abu Dhabi's stock market, the Abu Dhabi Securities Exchange, has almost quintupled its market cap in less than four years. And this uh, could potentially be an indication of overall economic development across the board. Uh, Vijay, do you think that this also reflects an increase in investment opportunities in the sustainability space? Absolutely. Sustainability is definitely the sector that everybody's looking for to investment. The only gap that actually has been existing is exactly which Mr. Mohammed actually put out, that it has to come on a consumer level. These initiatives taken by Mushrik to actually send out podcasts and get you know consumers the end point to actually understand the initiative and most importantly, how important it is, is very important. Just like Mr. Mohammed said about the air conditioners, uh, there's a lot of wastage of energy around the world, and that is something which can be very easily solved. It doesn't solve the problem of actually uh, the cl of clean energy sustainability, but it does you know, create awareness, and that awareness is actually coming in. The industry by itself has already become a multi-trillion dollar industry, and it does look like it's going to be probably the biggest industry going forward in the next 10 years. The capital raised through bonds, through uh, the markets, it's just going to be terrific. It's actually not going to be competing with the finance industry, but complementing it. It definitely will actually add on to the financial industry and not just that to the economics of any region that actually tries to develop a sustainability sector around their entire zone and more importantly, put it as part of the economy and not just a part of their agenda. And when we see this growth in the sustainability uh, in the sustainability sector, uh, Florian, I wanted to tie that back to something you mentioned earlier. You mentioned uh, a lot of initiatives that are happening simultaneously within the sustainability space. There's decarbonization, there's digitalization, there's desalination, solar energy, vertical farms, the list goes on. Um, but given this, uh, this multifaceted approach where there's so many things happening at the same time, do you think that um, there are some key industries to keep an eye on in 2023 uh, that will help drive the process in an outsized way towards economic development and sustainable development. Absolutely. There are, uh, of course, three main key industries. First one, of course, being oil and gas. And like Mr. Florian said, you know, Mobadla and all of the oil and gas companies are actually putting their best foot forward to actually solve this problem. And that's where the major, major uh, you know, benefit will actually come from because it's these industries which actually can solve the problem also and need to solve the problem also. The same time, I, we do actually believe that tourism is a major sector which actually can be helping in solving the problem. Tourism, not just in the Middle East, but all over globally, is something that actually can be done in a much more sustainable manner. Uh, besides that, the third industry that we're looking at is a semiconductor industry. The semiconductor industry actually has a lot of wastage which can be quite easily avoided with small tweaks and small innovations. That's where the innovations, uh, R&D, should be really the focus right now. These three sectors are the major ones. Of course, each sector can contribute a little bit and every little contribution goes a long way. Great, thank you. Um, yes, Florian, please. I would I would add from, from the perspective that given the uh, the opening remarks which have been done by uh, by Thomas and by you is, let's say, there is a call for action right now because we need we have only a few years until 2030, an important turn uh, milestone whether we can make it to turn it uh, the world uh, climate or uh, development or not. So therefore, it's a parallel approach which is required uh, on all on all streams. Uh, of course, we can't do all at, at the same t uh, at the same time with the same intensity. So we need to focus on the key ones, which Vijay also mentioned. Uh, but uh, we are really actively supporting uh, all our uh, as own assets. Number one, number two, to put into place, let's say, certain enablers which help other industries uh, to decarbonize. Whether it is uh, by providing hydrogen uh, for them to decarbonize uh, their current uh, processes, or whether it is also the trading of the car of carbon, like we invested in uh, Air Carbon Exchange, a company now operating here in Abu Dhabi Global uh, Markets. 
So these are other activities which, which help uh, to drive this forward. But the call is for action, and this will culminating in the end of the year with COP28, which is clearly under the theme to uh, make it uh, happen and to implement these activities. Action required. And, and Thomas, sure. yeah, yes, please. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was just saying the, the call to action, I think, is, is very relevant. And I would almost uh, urge everyone to think of, you know, there's a sectoral view, of course, but I think at some point the UN SDGs need to kind of come in and play a much more prominent role. I think that itself can be a framework for kind of guiding the investments, right? Because I think UN has put a lot of effort in coming up with these uh, SDGs. And I, my personal view is that these SDGs do need to be mainstreamed. So once they're mainstreamed and they're kind of part of the overall uh, investment framework, I, I think that can really accelerate uh, investments and move it forward. So, you know, there's a sectoral view, but also I think worth keeping the, the kind of goal in mind, if I put it that way. Absolutely. Movements on multiple fronts. Countries in the region have announced commitments toward net zero and and a, as a tangible example of late, Saudi Arabia recently announced its plan to plant a whopping 10 billion trees, uh, which are one fifth of its overall plan to plant 50 billion trees in the years to come. Um, so as we approach the end of the podcast, I also wanted to give everybody an opportunity to uh, give some closing remarks and, and uh, to round off the topic with uh, uh, closing remarks and and, and general uh, comments on on uh, particular endeavors that the region should focus on um, for the rest of the year. And Mohammed, we can start with you. Well, I'll start first by this podcast. I think communication is a cornerstone. Um, it, most of us know that we need to do something. Some of us know what we can do and quite a lot don't know really how this is going to change or what are the directions there. I think that from a startup perspective, there need to be communication with financial institutions like Mashrik Bank, like Mubadala, to understand the portfolio of the, of the opportunities that we have in the market. And then it's up to them then to devise instruments or, or funds that would help those startups um, uh, proceed. At the same time, I don't think that on the startup side, they know um, uh, the, the plans or the master plans of Mubadala or Mashrik or any other financial or, or business institution and how they can support them in their journey. So I think communication plays a very important role here uh, up and down this multi-tier solution that I mentioned earlier in the podcast. Thank you. And Florian, uh, we'll go to you next for closing comments. So I fully concur with Mohammed's po uh, point. Uh, communication is is key uh, to uh, increase the understanding on each other side, and we are happy to do that. Especially also for the startups. Uh, Mobadala has a startup Hub Seventy One at ADGM, uh, where we welcome uh, companies also in the field of uh, sustainability. So that's one. The second one is. In order to make this happen, this change about which we have been talking, we need people. And people is a key, is key to make uh, this uh, implementation happen with the speed we need. So that is, we need uh, enabling empowerment of people uh, to uh, take this forward. And that's what we take into our decisions also into account. Finally, with all our decisions, Whatever investment decisions we take, uh, we need to take into account the sustainability criteria. And that uh, comes to Thomas' uh, point. And that's why Mobadala has embedded those in the investment decisions, the ESG uh, criteria, uh, to take uh, this forward as a responsible investor. And that we encourage others to do so. And we communicate this. So Mubadala is a member of the One Planet Sovereign Wealth Fund organization, 46 uh, com uh, funds and sovereign wealth funds around the globe, working together to uh, actively drive with all the capital this change uh, for implementation. Thank you. So sustainability at the center of everyone's agenda, leveraging human capital and communications. Uh, Vijay, we'll, we'll go to you next for closing comments, please. I completely agree with the two of them. I think communication awareness is the most important thing 
awareness of uh, not just in a region but overall globally is what is going to make a difference because in the end it's just like how corona was or covid was you know that we are all in this together this is our home this is our planet and we have to do everything to actually make it sustain uh, we are definitely looking at you know certain regions doing better than others but if overall there is a global regulatory body that actually governs things and you know actually makes sure that you know it can be done on a global level like we see the amazon rainforest being reduced every year and that actually causing climatic change around the world that can only be done on a global level so uh, the urge really is that you know there should be all countries and all economies coming together to actually help this and solve this problem together great thank you and thomas uh, we'll round it off with you yeah. for your closing comments yeah, yeah. Look, maybe I, I will close off with something that I uh, maybe it's just an idea. Maybe it's elements that Mubadla is already doing. It's around free zones. You know, I think UAE has really kind of perfected this free zone approach. But I think there is a significant opportunity and potential for, for even existing free zones to transition into let's say what I would call digital zones, and maybe even look to build a new generation of free zones which has more of a sustainable development uh, you know footprint. You know, I think maybe that is something. That we can potentially look at, or the government can look at, and, and as I mentioned, Bubadla is already, I'm, I'm sure, doing some elements of that. But I would kind of maybe put that as my last uh, thought. Great, and, thank and, and, you. Obvi and obviously, you know, I mean, I do have to thank all of you. But yeah, uh, Thomas, I, I will uh, let you go. And then, yeah. absolutely, no, thank you for the thoughts or for the closing closing comments, and thank you to all of our panelists. Our our half half hour podcast and our time together has come to an end. Uh, we've had a great and interesting discussion around the topic of economic diversification and how it can go hand in hand with a sustainable future. Uh, we've heard some questions, we've gotten some answers, and we'll continue to get answers as the podcast series progresses. Uh, I'd like to thank our guests for being on this edition of the Mashrek Sustainability Dialogues. Mohamed Teleb, Florian Mertz, Vijay Valecha, and our host, Thomas Jacob, thank you so much for joining us today, and please join us again in the future.